All right, well, good afternoon and welcome to the IUPUI Virtual Student Town Hall. I'm Johnny Pryor, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, and I will serve as your moderator. Thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that all of us have been impacted not only by COVID-19, but also the most recent deaths of Black Americans and incidents of racism. Um, on behalf of IUPUI, we acknowledge that today is hashtag shutdown academia and hashtag shutdown STEM, which is a call to stop doing business as usual and do the work to eradicate anti-Black racism and academia in STEM. We see you. We see you and we hear you, IUPUI. We see you on social media. We see you showing up for each other ch and checking in on each other. We see you. I see you. At this time, I want to share a few preliminary matters. Uh, first, uh, this town hall is being recorded and we be a, will be available on the IUPUI website for future viewing and reference. Um, second, you will have the opportunity to hear remarks from Chancellor Paydar and learn more about the upcoming academic year on a broad range of topics about returning to school this fall. Um, also, third, uh, to ask questions, uh, please submit them through the Q&A section, which is located at the bottom center of your screen. Uh, the purpose of this virtual town hall is to share information and updates regarding the fall and provide an opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, several uh, campus leaders will address those questions that are submitted in the Q&A box. Uh, our panelists will aim to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, for those questions that are not answered during the town hall, we will strive to address those questions in future communications, as well as post them on the Student Affairs website. Um, at this time, I would like to introduce to you uh, Chancellor Paydar, who will provide uh, some remarks. Chancellor Paydar. Thank you, Johnny. And to all of the IUPI Jaguars out there, thank you for joining us this, this afternoon. Uh, we have missed you. We have missed uh, you on campus. We have missed uh, the campus itself, but we've been in contact uh, in different forms. Uh, before I begin and talk about fall, uh, I wanted to say that I could not agree more with Johnny's statement about working to eradicate anti-Black racism in academia and STEM. This is part of our campus's mission to create a welcoming and inclusive environment for all, for everyone. So just wanted to make sure that I, I repeated what, what Johnny had said at the beginning of the uh, program. The, uh, now it's been, only about three months since we made the important decision to take the spring semester online, although it feels like years, uh, it's, it's hard to believe. Uh, but uh, for some of you, uh, and about 7,000 students of IUPUI, in this three months, you graduated, and some of you are back uh, to start graduate school at IUPUI. For others, you're getting ready for your senior year, and wondering what that last year of college would look like. For everyone, there are lots of questions. So the hope today is to kind of talk and give you a picture of what, what we think fall is gonna be like, why we think we wanna go there in this, in this fashion, and answer as many questions as, as you have now online and post the rest of the answers, as Johnny said, on Student Affairs website. So we all know this, until there is a vaccine, uh, we need to do everything possible to lower the risk of transmission. There is no doubt about that. And uh, we have been very careful in the last three months thinking about fall. Uh, so we have formed a panel of experts, including the Dean of uh, School of Medicine, uh, the largest school of medicine in the country, uh, mind you and the Dean of Public Health and a number of others to look at possibilities for fall and if we should come back, what are the things that we need to worry about? 
and take care of and plan for. We also created 12 task forces from across our IUPUI campus and asked them, uh, look at these five possibilities for fall, you know, come 100% online, 100% on site, uh, hybrid form and, and different um, uh, scenarios and tell us what you think we need to do to make sure that we do two things. One is to keep our students, faculty, staff as safe as possible and also be able to deliver an education and that everyone has come to expect from programs that lead to IU or Purdue at IUPUI. So after all these discussions, we have decided that we'll offer a blend of online and face-to-face -face classes this coming fall. This fall is gonna be different, we all know that. And, uh, and, and while we expect most of our students to be on campus this fall, we'll be offering online courses for those of you who choose not to come to campus this fall or for some reason you can't. So we are doubling our efforts. We are in some cases teaching a course in two different modes, on-site and, and online, just to be able to satisfy and meet the needs of our students. This is what we owe our students to do to continue you uh, in your education at, at IUPUI. Now, for those of you that want to be on, on, on campus, we have been carefully planning for you and faculty staff return this fall. We've got input from um, health experts. We are following local, state, and national gu guidelines. And, and, uh, and we, have, we are, and we will be talking about that. We are doing all sorts of things. Things are going to be slightly different. But at the end of the day, we know that there may be possibilities of faculty, staff, or students to get sick with this. So we have an, an agreement with uh, IU Health that makes it very easy for, for everyone, students, faculty, staff, to register online on our website and to communicate if, the, if one of our students is not feeling well and go through that process with IU Health directly from our website, directly through our, our agreement that we have. And if there is a need for a test, the test will be done on campus as well as IU Health. But we, we are working on a number of other things to be prepared uh, just in case. So the ultimate goal is to educate, as I said, all of our students as well as we can, and but keep everyone safe. Now, we also know that uh, come, November-ish, that time of the year, when the weather starts turning and, and getting cold, the flu season will pick up. And when the flu season pick up, the peak, peak of flu season and COVID-19, we know it's not gonna be the most pleasant time. So what we have done, we have adjusted the calendar that so, so that on campus classes will end right at Thanksgiving, just a couple of days before that. And then we will come back again for those who want to be on campus uh, early February. But that period from Thanksgiving to early February, that fall semester is going to end, part of spring is going to start. We have created a winter term, uh, which I really want you to take a look at that. All of that will be online. The idea here is between Thanksgiving and February to protect our, not just all of our students. Remember, we have we have thousands of faculty staff and, and we want to make sure that everyone is protected in that period. So, so we want to talk about some of that, but justification for a change of calendar is because of that. Uh, dining is going to be different. Uh, housing is going to be different. Uh, we will talk about some of these special events. We will try to have accommodate that as much as possible, but it may be different. Social distancing will be uh, one that we, we promote on campus. We're gonna order, and we'll talk about all of these, we're gonna order uh, masks, cloth masks, for every student, couple of them, so you can wear it and wash it, but we require uh, that mask when you are indoors on our, on our campus. The classrooms, uh, it's gonna be uh, kind of less number of students in it, meaning that we have to make sure that as you sit, there will be six feet uh, distance between students, so we will we will have mark all of those things so that you are separated. Again, remember, education is extremely important, but health is also important, 
and all of us need to work together. We are going to uh, deep clean um, many areas every day, some places several times, some places overnight. We'll provide material for students to have to clean their, their area in the classroom if they wish. So we are working on all of those. And we started a few months ago anticipating if we should, because as you know, if you look for, a, for a, uh, disinfecting wipes, it's very hard to get it. And what we need is more than just a tiny little box. So we, we are working on all of those things to make sure that we provide a safe environment for all of our students when they come to our campus. And as I said, in some cases we'll have, uh, we are upping the IT in classroom so that we can uh, create some opportunities for students that are not in that classroom to be able to see it. So we are in a sense going to be running two universities simultaneously at the same time all for the benefit of our students and faculty and staff. I bet you have a lot of questions about, about many of these items. And, and for that, uh, I wanna first thank you uh, for uh, being here. I wanna thank all of you for cooperation as we go through fall. Without everyone's coming together and following guidelines, working together, taking care of themselves, taking their temperature on a daily basis, we are not going to be able to achieve the environment that we want for all of our students. So I wanna thank you in advance. And I know that I can count on all of our students. Uh, I'm gonna pass it to, back to Johnny so that we can begin uh, conversations with other panelists, as well as more importantly, your questions. But I'm gonna stay online. I wanna hear what you're saying. I wanna get a feeling, I wanna get your pulse as we go through this, this uh, town hall. Uh, meeting. Again, thank you very much for being here. Johnny, take it away. Yes, thank you, Chancellor Padar, and thank you very much uh, for your continued uh, leadership at this time. Uh, next, you know, Chancellor Padar referenced quite a bit the academic calendar. Uh, the first question is for um, Executive Vice Chancellor uh, Johnson. Would you please uh, share with the students sort of kind of go into further detail just about the academic calendar and kind of the various options between online face-to-face -face, uh, classes and that approach. Absolutely, John, Johnny, I'd be happy to. And it's complicated. I see a lot of questions coming in about that complexity um, and especially with respect to how it works with tuition. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen just for a moment because I have a visual that, that helps to, I think, address um, some of this complexity. And, and really let me reiterate that the complexity is really a byproduct of the flexibility that we're trying to add to maximize our community's health um, and also giving students as many options as we can. So first of all, at the top of the screen, you'll see um, the types of sessions that will be offered during the fall and covered by fall tuition. Um, and most of you know we have a, what we call a banded tuition structure, which means that there's a single rate that students pay, but within that rate, they can take anywhere between 12 and 18 credit hours. So, so you'll see, first of all, that we will still continue to have a 16-week session um, with the last three weeks online, as the chancellor mentioned. And yes, there will be final exams online at the end of that standard section. What we've also introduced though at the top are a couple of new options. First of all, we've let faculty know that if they're able to shift some of their content to online, then perhaps it could be possible to complete the semester with the learning goals for that course achieved if they end by Thanksgiving. Um, and if that's the case, of course, finals for 13 week sessions would happen just before Thanksgiving break. So right around here. That then leaves a little bit of space for an optional three week intense uh, winter session, if you will. Um, we're just in the process of helping schools begin to think about developing these or, or translating some of their existing courses into three week sessions. I don't really think there's gonna be a lot of them because that's pretty intense. We would likely need to limit student enrollment in three credits um, because it would be a really, really um, again, intense three week period, but there could be several of these offered. And if students wanted to, if they hadn't fully taken advantage of that 18 credits, they could pick up, for example, a three credit um, seminar or elective during this first winter session. So all of this will be under the fall banded tuition structure. 
under the spring, we also introduce a new six week session. And that will run from De December 21st until February 7th. Um, this I think we'll be likely to see more of because this really is similar to the current summer courses that we offer right now, for example, many of our summer courses um, are online already. They've been developed to be online. Um, and they oftentimes um, align well with our general education credits, for example, for undergraduates. So that would be part of the spring banded tuition structure. Students might take one or two classes in this winter session if they wanted to, and then take the balance of their credits during the remainder of the spring semester. And this might be helpful, for example, for students who are essential workers and might need to spread their, their learning out a little bit more across the fall, or, I'm sorry, across the beginning of the term and the remainder of the spring. Um, but as the chancellor mentioned, there'll still be a standard 16 week option as well um, that will run right up until the end of May and end at the normal time. I saw a lot of questions about, do I have to sign up for one of these new sessions? These are entirely optional. Again, we think that they might be good options for students who want to spread out their learning a little bit, um, but it's, it's something that, that one could take advantage of, but doesn't have to take advantage of. I know that the big question out there right now is which of my classes are going to align with these different options. Faculty just found out about these different options only just over a week ago. We, we needed to wait until the restart committee, which was chaired by the Dean of Medicine, issued their guidance for the fall. And once we did, we provided them with some academic program guidance that was intended to help them to think quickly um, about whether their course would lend itself well to each of these different options. And faculty right now are being able to, to register their, their um, thoughts with their department chairs or with their deans. We're hoping that within the next month and a half, we'll have those determinations finalized so that by the middle of July, you should be able to get online and, and look to see exactly which length your course is going to have and which modality it's going to have. And of course, there's adding and dropping that could be done if you're not, if you're not comfortable or interested in those decisions. And with that, I, I think I'll pause, Johnny, because I know that there's lots of other questions to add, get through as well. Let me take this down. Thanks. Okay. You know, this is a sort of academic related question, but I'll I take it to um, uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Broker regarding the classroom space. Can you speak to what the university will be doing to minimize the number of students uh, per classroom and to uh, create safe social distance, distancing, not only in the classrooms, but on, on campus? Thank you, Johnny. I'd be happy to. So we have actually had a team. Um, IUPUI is great and known for our collaboration and it has come to pass on this as well. We've had a great team uh, between our registrar's office, our uh, Center for Teaching and Learning, some of their staff in UIS, as well as our facilities um, staff who have been going out to classrooms and really identifying the number of seats that we can have in any particular classroom based on maintaining that six foot um, distancing um, guidelines that we're using. So we are looking to reduce the capacity in our classrooms to provide that guidance. We will also be putting hand sanitizers and disinfecting cleaning supplies um, throughout buildings, but then also in classrooms, as we will be asking for all of our campus community to help us in maintaining um, a clean and, and uh, safe space. Okay, thank you very much for that. And I just wanna go into some questions about housing and also dining. So back to you, uh, BC Broker, can you speak to you know, what options the students will have this fall in terms of on-campus uh, dining options? So we are looking um, to maintain our dining options. So food court will be open, um, tower dining will be open, although both of those will be different experiences as we try to maintain safe environments. So for tower dining, it's not gonna be the self-serve that we've had in the past. Um, there'll be served meals, um, looking to really provide some full meal options at each of our stations working through those. We'll be using contactless um, ordering payments, those type of things, um, some online ordering to assist with this. We will also be increasing our um, staff who are out actively cleaning um, the spaces, as well as providing some guidance and kind of our safety ambassadors in spaces 
so that we can help navigate, maintain those safe distances, as well as provide um, guidance as, as we look for seating options. So seating will be reduced. Um, so for those of you who have been around, we went through a project to increase the seating capacity in the campus center. Um, unfortunately, with this situation, we're going to decrease that seating, but we are trying to be creative and we'll actually be looking to add some additional exterior seating options. As we all know, being outside is actually one of the ways that we can help provide um, some additional safety precautions. So we're looking at all of those options um, as we move along and get ready for the start of the school year. Thank you very much for that. Next question is for uh, Dean uh, Skillman, uh, Head of um, Housing and Residential Life. Can you uh, share with the students what they can expect for those that are living on campus in the fall, what students can expect when they live on campus, including uh, about, you know, move in and just the, the experience in, in general? Yeah, thanks, Johnny. Happy to answer that question. If I forget something, just remind me, because it'll be a lot I'll try to talk about. So, you know, as our housing team, number one, we're excited to have students come back to live with us. You know, we've had some live with us, even have some summer students live with us now, but we've missed them. We miss them a lot. And so it's going to be awesome to have students back. Um, as we plan for the fall, it starts with, you know, the safety and the well-being of our students. And so um, our facilities team and housing will be modifying the way that we clean spaces. You know, we'll be following the, the building guidelines that are there for, for housing programs and the IU family campuses. And we'll increase the frequency of cleaning in our public restrooms. Um, in, in areas where we have bathrooms that students share, North Hall, for example, Ball Residence Hall, for example, we'll probably schedule students to use those spaces and assign students to bathrooms rather than have um, all bathrooms open to everybody to kind of re to reduce how many people are using a particular bathroom. You know, for our for our students all over campus, we'll we'll be uh, providing some guidance and guidelines on how to clean their own space um, regularly, whether it's a room or if you're in Riverwalk, um, the kitchen and bathroom areas to make sure that we try to disinfect as much as we can. And, and we will have, you know, I think students who've lived with us before, or if you're brand new to living with us, you'll notice a, uh, a higher frequency of our, of our facilities team walking around and disinfecting spaces. And probably some folks that, that work for, on our team that aren't part of facilities that are also helping to disinfect to make sure we keep people safe. In terms of the experience, we know that students who want to live on campus want a housing experience, um, or at least a version of it um, that that it allows people to interact, to learn, to live together, um, to have close access to all the outstanding resources on campus. And our Residence Life team is working on how to implement um, that plan for us right now. And so we will have student staff that live on campus and support students. We will have professional staff that live on campus and support students that live on camp. You know, they're, they're available 24 hours a day, just like usual. Um, there may be some practices that are different, but we will have to, when we program, we'll have to have less people um, and follow the guidelines for how many people we can have in a room. Um, as Vice Chancellor Broker mentioned, we may be doing some things outside um, and do a lot more outside um, to keep people safe. And, um, but we will, you know, as we, as we look at our, our programming spaces, our lounge spaces, we'll have a protocol for each space when somebody enters, how to disinfect, how to stay apart from each other in those spaces, and how to disinfect when you leave, because it's going to be on every, all of us um, to help each other um, disinfect spaces. But we also want to make sure students have a chance to interact and have an on-campus housing experience. A couple other points, and I'm sure there's more questions, but a couple other common questions we get. Um, living together with somebody else versus single occupancy. Um, we, we are going to do both. You know, we'll have fewer people living on campus this, sem this, this semester and this year. However, we have a lot of students that have already indicated they want to live with a mutually selected roommate in North Hall and University Tower and Ball Hall. So right now we are assigning and working with students that want to live together to put them together in those spaces. Over in Riverwalk, the occupancy for uh, is defined by bedroom. And so if you live in a four bedroom, you'll live with three other people. If you live in a two bedroom, you'll live with another person and you'll share the space in there. But you'll have your own bedroom that's lockable and private. Um, and, and Johnny, I think you had asked about move in. Um, we are still planning how we're gonna implement a move in that um, maintain social distancing and physical distancing. Um, but what we know is we need to start with the first day of classes and make sure everybody is in their housing assignment by the first day of classes and work backwards. And so we will probably begin moving people in um, and I'm gonna give you an estimation. So if it's a little bit off, please don't hold that against me. But we will probably start moving people in seven to 10 days 
prior to the start of class to make sure we do it in a responsible way um, that doesn't congest up the campus and doesn't um, increase the risk of exposure for our students. All right, thank you very much for that, Dean Skillman. Uh, the next question uh, is for uh, Ms. Eliza uh, Frame, who's our Director of International and Scholar Services. Can you share uh, what uh, advice you would give uh, to international students who may not be permitted to enter the U.S. because of laws imposed by um, their government and may not be able to come to take advantage of face-to-face of -face classes? Sure, I'd be happy to address this. This is a, a big question for international students. And I just also want to take an opportunity to say how resilient I feel our international students have been um, and how challenging it has been to have to make important decisions about travel, financial considerations, classes, and um, you know, health and safety concerns and all of those things during a period when there's been you know, little firm information to work from. So we're thinking of you, we miss you, and we're looking forward to continuing to support you as you work through these important considerations for the fall. Um, you know, one of the important um, um, sort of considerations at this time for international students is that for the spring and summer, the U.S. Uh, Student and Exchange Visitor Program and Department of State did allow special flexibility for um, universities to alter their mode of education and to allow students to maintain their visa status and continue to make progress through their academic programs, uh, despite having to, um, you know, take, take their coursework online. Um, that has not, uh, that guidance has not been issued for the fall. So we are still awaiting guidance about what will be allowed for international students in the fall. So we will, ma we will maintain our web pages updated. We will um, share information by email and let everyone know once guidance has been issued for the fall by the US government. Um, but for now, our recommendation is that international students work closely with their academic programs to get registered for the classes that they believe they need that best suit their academic needs at this time, and then um, you know, make adjustments as needed once the fall 2020 schedule of classes is updated. So again, um, just continue to watch for more information as we learn what the guidance will be for the fall. We will certainly make everyone aware of that. Thank you, Eliza. And I know guidance is, is uh, still will be uh, forthcoming, but just want to stay with you for a moment. So for international students, if, if the course is permitted, would they be permitted to take classes fully online if the classes they need or are they able to do that? Uh, so international students are, um, you know, able to enroll online just as any other IUPUI student would be. Um, but there are many questions still from students about whether that would mean that they're um, immigration record would need to be ended and then they would need to apply for a new visa upon return later. So there are a lot of important considerations for students um, in order to make the decision as to whether they can stay home and uh, maintain their visa status as was allowed in the spring semester. But given that that was special um, flexibility um, authorized by you know, US government agencies, uh, it can't be confirmed at this time for the fall. So we will absolutely let students know just as soon as we've also been updated about that. And it, it is something that we would recommend that they do stay in close communication about academic programs and what they're planning for course mode of instruction will be for the fall. Okay, uh, thank you for that. The next question is for, for Dr. Weldy, uh, Vice Chancellor uh, for Student Affairs. Uh, can you share what, what type of, of programs and events uh, that students uh, can expect on campus this fall and any type of uh, guidance you may have for student organizations. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Johnny. Uh, in regards to programs and events, uh, I'm sure that there are a lot of questions in regards to Weeks of Welcome and Regatta. Uh, what I can tell you is that both uh, Weeks of Welcome and Regatta will be taking place this year, uh, but will have a strong virtual component uh, to them with uh, some face-to-face -face interactions. And so as we move forward uh, to the start of the year, uh, more details will be shared. Um, and I'm sure that uh, a lot of student organizations, uh, you know, are wondering, you know, what, is, what are things going to be like once we're on campus? You know, how do we interact? Uh, I would say that uh, the guidelines for student orgs uh, will be the same as other departments and offices across campus. 
uh, when it comes to following social distancing guidelines, as well as wearing masks in public settings or spaces. Uh, however, I do expect that student orgs will be limited in the number of people who are able uh, to gather together. Um, um, they will have to utilize Zoom and other video conferencing platforms to hold large group meetings, as well as consider reducing the size of their programs and events. Uh, something, uh, uh, something else that I would strongly encourage with some of those program and events is just kind of rethinking them. Maybe it would, it would be better uh, if they were held outdoors. Uh, obviously, the start of the year, the weather is a little bit nicer. And so those are things that, uh, that we'll be looking at. So there is more information uh, to come uh, as we uh, look to the start of the uh, fall semester. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Welty. I'll go back to you, um, BC Broker. Receiving some questions about um, the, the increase in, in, in tuition and just the costs associated with, with fall, whether students are online or face-to-face. -face. Can you speak to uh, just um, maybe some of the uh, just the, the reasoning for the cost increase in tuition for fall? So, Johnny, thank you. So, we really are trying to, as, as you've indicated, as the Chancellor has indicated, really are trying to provide as much and as close as possible to the same experience for our students as they come to our campus. Um, so, we are trying to balance that with all of the needs for the campuses. Obviously, there will be additional um, cost and and things as we change our structures up a bit just to make sure that we are keeping people as safe as we possibly can thank you very much for that and i just want to stick with you one of the things you said is talking about kind of having for the same experience uh well the during the the online when the time that the campus is online uh will students have access to um labs library um it support at the, during that period so, and I may phone a friend here um, from some of my other colleagues, but I think that our intent really is during those online periods, during that, that winter season, flu season, we really are looking to reduce that uh, density on campus even more than what we're trying to do for our normal um, 13 weeks. So I think that, you know, we're gonna have to take some of these and just kind of work through them situation by situation. Um, but we really are trying to reduce that density so that we can help maintain um, that, that physical distancing to keep people as safe as possible. Okay. Uh, thank you. The next question is uh, for uh, Dean Glatton, Dean of Undergraduate um, e Education. Uh, can you share whether, you know, at this point, uh, whether uh, students will be able to take advantage of, of on-campus employment this fall? Excuse me, definitely, Johnny. Uh, the plan, it, it, you know, here's the, the thing is, we've been, we continue to employ. We've, we employed students from the time that we moved everything remote in the spring. Um, and in through the summer, we've continued to employ students. So absolutely, there will be student employment positions on campus this fall. Some of those positions may be more remote than in person, depending on how a particular office is operating, or it could be a combination thereof. But certainly one thing we've proven is that, that students um, are as flexible, uh, probably more flexible than we are on, on the, uh, the technology. And uh, we found a lot of supervisors that, that had no problem shifting the work that students were doing to virtual environments. And certainly with offices being open for face-to-face -face interactions, we're absolutely gonna need uh, students to help uh, in those offices as well. So the answer, long answer, but the answer is yes. Okay, uh, thank you. The next question is uh, back to, to Dr. Johnson. If you could just clarify something in terms of the, the online face-to-face -face classes. Uh, do students have a choice in whether they take online only or does it depend on uh, whether the professor's uh, course is online or fully in person? Yeah, thanks, Johnny. That's a, and it depends. Um, for example, if there's a course that has multiple sections, um, such as lots of our general education courses, I would imagine that there will be both 100% online as well as face-to-face as -face options available to students. If there's only a single instance um, or one section of a class offered, it's really going to depend on the learning goals for the class. What we've asked faculty and their chairs or you know, the people that they report to to consider most of all is, is what are the learning goals for the course? We know that some classes really do depend heavily on um, a face-to-face -face context. You know, if you're learning how to 
do injections or if you're learning how to do studio work in an art class, those are the sorts of courses that we'll really prioritize for face-to-face -face as well as some of our clinical, clinical classes um, and first-year seminars. We know that our beginning students, it's really important for them to, to become part of a social network. So anyway, we've provided guidance to, to um, schools and departments to really kind of think through the learning goals for the course. If a course can be moved easily online, we've asked faculty that if, a, if it hasn't been already planned to be online, to try to add a face-to-face -face component. So that might mean that the lecture portion of a course is delivered through um, Canvas, but maybe there are recitation sections or discussions or opportunities for collaborations or on projects that happen face-to-face. -face. So we're really trying to think as creatively as possible um, given that there's, there's limits on numbers of students who can be in classrooms, as, been, as has been said already. Okay, thank you for that. I want to go uh, back to, to Dean uh, Gladden. You know, in the event that a student must um, self-quarantine or test positive for COVID, can you talk about what options that students may have to continue the, their, their studies? Sure, Johnny. Um, thank you for that question. It's a really important question. And uh, certainly we are planning for that. Um, one of the things that we're asking all faculty to do when there are face-to-face -face, uh, and in-person interactions is to record the and capture the lecture uh, on uh, so that that can be reviewed at another time by students. Um, it's, easy, it, it's easy to do and, and when we're doing things virtually, but it's possible also to do in the classroom. Um, if that specific case arises, I would recommend any student do a number of things, including seeking um, the proper support that has already been talked about related to one's health, but I'd also strongly encourage communicating with an advisor and communicating with each of the individual faculty members to let them know that, um, that, that you, the student is experiencing some difficulty and to request some accommodation in that class as needed. Um, so I think that the guy we're, we're, we're working on is trying to be as flexible as possible and to certainly account for situations like that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my next question is to uh, Associate Vice Chancellor for Graduate Education, uh, Dean Blum. Uh, you've heard, uh, you know, a lot of the discussion and a lot of, so far we've, it's been focused on um, undergraduate education. Can you speak to, you know, what if any parts of the conversation maybe um, is the same or maybe different considerations that graduate students may have as they're planning for fall? Thanks, Johnny, and I'm delighted to talk to the students today. There are some commonalities and some differences for our graduate and professional students. Certainly, uh, you will be juggling online classes again and perhaps even some on-site classes. And I see in the chat box a lot of questions related to that. And many of you will also be engaged in research and thinking about practicums and internships. And you're really going to need <clears throat> to work closely with the program advisors and the faculty in your schools on how to navigate that for the fall. We've done our best to really set up um, the, the perfect, I think, um, environment to do research safely. Uh, you'll be getting a lot of guidance. There are, uh, the faculty members have developed uh, plans for safe work in laboratories and social distancing, um, personal protective equipment. We're working very closely with the schools on that. But similarly, those in our clinical programs also, there's a lot of discussion in your schools. And I know that the faculty and the staff are gonna be there to guide you and make this a productive fall. So uh, looking forward to it. And we're also encouraging, I saw a question about TAs. Will we need more TAs? And will we have TAs to help the professors? Um, we're certainly um, guiding the professors to try to talk about their TA needs for their classroom to make sure the TAs are available. And also so you who are, are going to be a TA know um, what times you will be working and, and have plenty of uh, space to juggle your various responsibilities. So I think it's gonna be a good fall for graduate and professional students and we wanna make it uh, as safe and productive as we can. All right, uh, thank you. And next, going to uh, Marvin Smith, Executive Director of Financial Aid. Um, can you share any special um, considerations that students may have for the fall, thinking about for just from a uh, financial aid perspective? Yes, thanks, Johnny. Um, I, I know that the, um, the coronavirus has impacted families and family income. Students haven't been able to maybe work and have lost their part-time jobs. 
some great questions we've had about working on and off campus and remotely. Um, I want to encourage every family that's been impacted negatively uh, to reach out to our office. Um, there's something called a special circumstance form where we can reevaluate a student's federal financial aid eligibility based on their estimated um, income now versus when they filed the FAFSA, they were looking back at 2018 income. Uh, we're going to develop a plan to review those quickly. Um, for loss of income like that, the, the federal government and the state of Indiana um, accepts those professional judgment um, uh, changes to your FAFSA and it could result in more federal and state aid. So encourage you to reach out to our office. I'll put our email in the chat. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. And the next question is uh, for uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Broker. We couldn't have a town hall without talking about parking. Uh, so can you uh, share with us, you know, any changes or uh, special, um, you know, circumstances that that parking is uh, providing, you know, in light of the, the changes uh, to the academic calendar? So we are looking, um, as you know, as, as Dr. Johnson mentioned, you know, this has all come about fairly quickly. So we are looking at some potential changes for parking uh, for this upcoming year, especially as it relates to the academic calendar. Um, I wish I had final answers for you today, but we are still kind of working through some of those, trying to balance the needs of all. So please stay tuned. Um, the parking permits for students go online on August 1st. So we will have information that we can share prior to that date. Um, and then I'll also include the, you know, we will continue with our normal uh, student permits as well as our North Campus permits to provide some options. And we are working hard to um, continue our shuttle lines so that we can provide those opportunities for students while we increase um, the cleaning of those um, buses during the day. Uh, thank you. I want to go uh, back to uh, Ms. Frame. If you could talk about um, study abroad, if there's been any um, recommendations in terms of, of study abroad for the fall or for the next academic year. Sure, I'd be happy to. I know this is a big question on students' minds and everyone um, in the Office of International Affairs is, um, is, is concerned about these decisions as well. Um, we are um, decisions are being made right now about the fall 2020 study abroad options and those decisions should be announced later this summer um, sometime after July 30th so students um, you know will just need to stay tuned for more information again we're going to be updating everyone just as soon as those decisions are made um, but due to CDC guidance and Department of State guidance those you know study abroad options were suspended for the spring and the summer 2020. So again, more information to come soon and those decisions are being made as we speak. Sure. Uh, uh, Chancellor Paydar, did you have any uh, uh, remarks or updates? I was, I was going to say that the decision has been made actually just, just recently not to have study abroad this coming fall. Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank, you. thank you for that um, clarification. Uh, the next question is uh, for uh, Dr. Weldy. Uh, can you sp speak about if there's any plans so far about any protocols uh, for students that may uh, contract, uh, contact uh, COVID-19 and the need to, to self-quarantine? Uh, yes, and uh, I'll start. And if uh, Mr. Skillman has uh, any uh, additions to make, he can go right ahead. Uh, so what we're doing is we've set aside uh, spaces uh, within, uh, within the residence halls uh, for such situations so that uh, if we do have a, a case where a student or students uh, either uh, have possible symptoms or uh, have been tested positive, uh, we will be able to move them into a space uh, of isolation on campus within the residence halls uh, for, for a period of time. Uh, and then also following other uh, protocol that, that are set up um, uh, through the university. Dean Skillman, is there anything else you'd uh, like to add? That really covers that. The only thing I would, say, would add is that there is a group that we would work with directly that, that are experts on how to manage a, a situation like that. And we're gonna take their guidance 
We also know that if a student is self-quarantined, they're going to need to get food and they're going to need to have access to um, cleaning supplies and laundry supplies. So we'll be ready to support them um, if a student should end up in that situation. We also, there is, there's good guidance out there on how to clean a space where the student was living um, and, and how do we make sure that other students, um, their, their risk is reduced significantly. Um, and so we'll follow all that as guided to do, as guided to do so. Yeah, and just for clarification as well, that uh, the uh, places that we've set aside uh, within the residence halls are for students who will be living in the residence halls, not, not for those who will be off campus. Yeah, uh, th thank you for that clarification. I want to go uh, back to Do Dr. Johnson regarding the fall academic uh, schedule calendar. I know that you know, that's in progress and being uh, modified and changes being made, you know, based on the restart committee's recommendations. Uh, can you share just an estimated timeline of when you anticipate um, that the updated um, fall schedule be available? Sure, yeah, our target deadline for making that available to students is currently July 15th. Um, and at that time, you should be able to log in as, as you normally would to register for classes and see which modality and which term lengths um, the classes that you've registered for have. Um, and again, we're, we're hoping that that provides people still with plenty of time to do adding and dropping if, if that doesn't meet with their, their needs. Um, but that's our, our goal. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I want to go, go back to BC Broker, receiving um, a couple of um, questions asking for, for clarification just around um, the tuition um, increase and, and just fees for students. I don't know if there's anything additional that you may be able to share just to add uh, more clarification or context. Um, I'm trying to think through Johnny and I, and I understand the question. I know that, you know, anytime that we have a tuition increase, it is not done lightly. We do want to make sure that we are taking into account our students, but we also then are making sure that we can provide all of the resources that our students need um, as, we, as they um, come and join us either on campus or virtually. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Uh, the next question, I want to go to um, Dean Gladden. We're getting lots of questions about, um, you know, kind of thinking about scenarios where students might be uh, immune compromised. You know, will they have a choice to take classes online um, if it's offered in person, um, if they're not comfortable taking a face-to-face -face, um, class to, due to being um, high risk? Yeah, Johnny, the goal would be for every student that is immune compromised, taking care of someone that's immune compromised, uh, have concerns related to that, to be able to complete their coursework online. Um, that will be easier to fully tell once this calendar, in terms of how that will, will be accomplished. It, it could be a combination of fully online classes and hybrid classes where lectures will be recorded and that sort of thing. Um, but once the full um, modalities are released, so how you will take your course, then it would be a, a good point in time to touch base with an advisor, whoever your advisor is, and to, to walk through the ability to do that. But certainly that's the intention. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Weldy, I know earlier we talked a little bit about uh, regatta. We also received questions about um, weeks of welcome. Uh, can you talk about you know, whether there'll still be uh, weeks of welcome uh, this fall and, and what that may look like in our new context? Uh, sure. Uh, like I noted before, uh, week, weeks of welcome uh, will, uh, will take place this year, uh, but there will be a strong virtual component. Uh, we realize that we will have students who will be on campus, uh, and so there will be uh, some limited face-to-face uh, -face interactions, uh, but, we, but we are working uh, with our collaborative partners across campus because uh, we, we want students to be engaged. Uh, you know, throughout the year, but especially at the beginning of the year, uh, as students, uh, you know, begin kind of reconnecting and, and building those relationships. And so we're, we're working hard to, to provide uh, something for everyone. All right, thank you. We'll go uh, back to uh, Dean Skillman uh, regarding um, housing. Received a number of questions uh, regarding um, housing options for students during the, the online period. Can you speak about, you know, based on what you know now, if you could share, um, you know, any information, like options for students in that online period? 
Yeah, happy to answer that. Um, we know there's going to be students during the online period that need housing. And we there will be a process similar to the one we had in the spring to accommodate the students who truly have to be here over the break periods. And uh, I don't have that process to send out today, but we'll have that out in a timely way in the fall once students get here to make sure that we that we do not have anybody that doesn't have a place to go. Um, we were very concerned about that in the spring and um, made sure to try to accommodate everybody that we could. I see a lot of questions in there about the um, about rate questions or rate adjustment questions based off the new calendar. That's something that we know. I know that question's out there as a director for housing, working with um, our campus leaders and working with our other housing programs. And we'll, we will address that and send a note out to our students that have either applied for housing or have a signed contract as soon as we have an update on, on both the breaks and then any kind of impact that the new calendar has on um, kind of on the rate structure. Uh, thank you. Uh, go back to um, Dean Gladden. Uh, can you talk about what are the, the expectations? Is there a requirement for students to wear masks um, in the classroom? If you could just clarify that for students that do decide to take classes um, on campus, uh, whether required to, to, to wear masks in, in the classrooms. Yeah, so uh, as a part of uh, IU and IUPUI's um, safety precautions, masks are a part of the public health guidance, and they certainly will be a requirement in our classrooms in the fall of 2020 uh, as a mecha one mechanism that we each can take to keep an, our entire community safe. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, looking uh, to, to the future, getting a couple questions about um, commencement 2021. Um, uh, Dr. Johnson, can you share what, if any, information you might have uh, currently about uh, looking at uh, graduation? Um, I am not sure yet. That's a great question. I was trying to phone a friend when I heard you call <laughs> on me for this. I think we're trying to figure out as quickly as possible, you know, how we can safely have this event, which I know is so important to so many students and their families. Yeah, I think the chancellor can respond to that. Oh, good. Okay. So we have, we have two phone a friend requests. Uh, <laughs> Chancellor Madar. Well, the commencement actually is my favorite time, uh, event, and I'm sure yours and students who work so hard that they want to be recognized. We want to have them up there so that we can say, you graduated, you went through it. So we don't know what's going to happen by May. I mean, if there is a vaccine, that changes things. But I have some good news. We've never had winter commencement. For the first time this, this winter, for those that are graduating winter, we are going to have a very nice but virtual commencement so that we can recognize students for the first time that are graduating this, this, uh, this winter times or the end of the fall. So that uh, uh, we are working on to create. Spring, hopefully we could get together, uh, but we'll see where we will be uh, you know, eight, nine months from now. All right, thank you. I want to go, uh, go back to uh, Marvin Smith and financial aid and thinking about billing. Will there be any uh, changes to the, the billing cycle or financial aid based on this uh, new counter or any of uh, special considerations that students need to be mindful of? No, I think that um, the, the billing and financial aid disbursement will be the same. So um, the, the fall semester, um, will be under the banded tuition rate, 12 to 18 credit hours is billed at the same rate. Um, financial aid refunds will begin um, 10 days before the start of classes. So that week right before classes, if you're expecting financial aid that exceeds tuition fees and housing, um, encourage you to sign up for direct deposit and you'll have your funds a week before classes start. For the spring semester, um, that winter intercession will be attached to the spring semester. And the plan right now is um, that the fees will be due um, for the spring semester in January, and we will disperse um, refund excess financial aid 10 days before the start of the spring, the official spring start. Um, that, that winter intercession is really kind of a bargain because you can take those um, credits and make it part of banded tuition for the spring semester. So it might be a, a way for a student to lessen their load during the spring semester by uh, taking a, a six-week class during that winter intercession. But 
In terms of financial aid and how that will be applied, it, it'll be uh, very similar as it has been in the past. Johnny, could I could I just have one minute to of course. yes to, to acknowledge that we know that COVID nineteen and and the way the whole society came together or did not come together for a period has created financial issues for so many people. So we recognize that. Uh, we the our expenses at the university has dramatically increased as we have to do much more than what we normally do while we have to have the faculty to teach it just a couple of things in, in here one is that we have asked every department every school every office to cut five percent of their expenses everyone including my office just so that we can manage financially because the, 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 the costs are enormous and we have to, we have to find ways of, of, of helping with all of these extra expenses without charging it on students. So that's, that's one thing that we have done. And we have also, uh, we are considering to eliminate uh, distance education. That's, that's uh, $90 per 30 credit hours from students. So we want to cut that out as well. I recognizing we need that's going to put us more in hole at the university, but but we want to help students as much as possible. And uh, and furthermore, the winter session uh, we are making it free of charge. The average credit hours of our students never gets to close to eighteen credits, but we hope that by having that extra uh, uh, semester. But unlike summer where we charge for that, that we will make it free uh, uh, to students up to the 18 credits. So we are mindful of all that. We are working on it just to make sure that we will continue uh, supporting our students as we go through this, all of us together. Thank you, Johnny. All right, thank you. We have time for just one last uh, question. We have a couple of questions regarding uh, campus health and uh, counseling services. For Dr. Weldy, will, uh, will counseling and campus health offer in-person or, or, or will those services be virtual this fall? Uh, great question. Uh, thank you, Johnny. Uh, CAPS will, will be providing uh, prim primarily uh, remote clinical services uh, beginning this fall. Uh, however, it is preparing a series of workshops uh, to be offered to the general student population and held on a reoccurring basis to support students in coping with uh, the various types of stress. Um, mental health and interpersonal violence prevention, uh, outreach and workshops will continue to be offered uh, primarily in uh, remote formats. Uh, in regards to uh, uh, Campus uh, Health Center, uh, there will be a virtual component, but we also know that there is a need to, to meet with students uh, in person as well. And so we're still working out those details, but I, but I will tell you that our locations in Coleman Hall and as well as our location in the campus center will be open this fall. All right, well, I see the time is, is two o'clock. I just want to thank you all uh, for joining us today. Be sure to continue uh, to monitor the IUPUI website and your university email for updates. Um, on behalf of, of campus leadership, I want to thank you uh, for participating um, in uh, today's um, town hall. Um, also, for all the questions that we didn't have opportunity uh, to get to, uh, we will uh, endeavor to answer those questions with the emails addresses that you provided. But again, uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, be well and take care.